All right. Well, um, I'm really excited to be here today. I'm also excited just to kind of be here in person, and I think it's uh, fantastic at Stanford. We're blessed with the wonderful weather to do things like this. So I'm going to talk a little bit today about, I, I called this Cyber Strategy 101. Um, and so I want to talk through kind of why we need cyber strategy, what the threats are, and then talk you through like the last 10 years of cyber strategy history. Um, because we're kind of at the cusp of some big changes potentially. So it's good to know kind of how we got to where we are today. Okay, so why did I get 60 minutes to talk to you guys today? Well, it's because our world, our economies, our societies, every part of how we function and operate, especially after the pandemic, are, are based on digital foundations. So whether it's healthcare, transportation, manufacturing, everything is based on a reliance on digital technologies. When cyber threats introduce vulnerabilities in these digital technologies, it becomes sometimes um, existential, sometimes annoying, um, and it becomes a, a giant, giant headache for policymakers because the scope of the problem is so large and so diverse. So why do we need a cyber strategy? So the, you know, people often say strategy is you know, ways, ends, means, but really the purpose of strategy is to articulate priorities and goals. When you have a very, very large and diverse problem like cyber that touches every part of the economy and every part of national security, you need to have a way to rally the forces so that everyone understands what their role is, what they're supposed to be doing. We need to delegate lines and efforts to subordinate organizations. So theoretically, the best strategy um, and for cyber, these strategies are going to come out of the executive. They're going to come out of the White House primarily and then flow down to all the various agencies. But the idea being that a strategy is going to articulate kind of what do we believe in, what do we care about, what's the important priorities that we need to fight for, who is doing what in this strategy, and then how are we going to accomplish it. Now, we don't always get to all three of those things in the strategies. I know some strategies are good on some things and bad on the others, but we'll talk through kind of where our strengths and weaknesses have been over the last 10 years. All right, so I'm going to start with the external threat. And this is kind of why do we need cyber strategy. And for those of you who are not as, like, as into the cyber world as I am, maybe you haven't seen all these things happening. So we'll just give a brief refresher so everyone understands kind of what the threat is. So the, the US government identifies, um, I mean, there's lots of cyber threats, but it prioritizes the following threats. China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, and then they kind of had this like broad group which was non-state actors, and that's morphed over the years. Sometimes that's ISIS. Um, right now it's a lot about criminals, cyber criminals that are leading the ransomware, um, the ransomware efforts that are occurring. But this threat has changed over the years. So initially kind of the big actor was Russia, and they continue to be one of the prominent actors. The thing with Russia is that they, um, not only are they very good, so they're building on the strengths of uh, the GRU, their kind of typical intelligence organization, but they also kind of really just don't care how people respond to them, which has allowed them to uh, experience a lot of experimentation over the last 10 years. So as they've invaded, for example, Ukraine and Crimea, they, they use these kind of battlegrounds as an experimental test ground for looking at different types of cyber vulnerabilities and cyber exploits all the while um, conducting similar kind of cyber exploits and vulnerabilities against states like the United States. Now, despite the fact that Russia is probably the kind of best bad guy out there, they're also, um, and this is going to sound slightly strange, they're somewhat restrained. So while you see with Russia a lot of experimentation in places like Ukraine, and you also see them allowing a lot of non-state actor badness coming out of Russia, so the kind of cyber criminals, um, they generally uh, restrain themselves when it comes to US strategic resources. So you don't see the Russians conducting cyber attacks against the United States to create large scale physical effects. So there's some level of kind of interstate deterrence that's going on there. China I would consider kind of the second bad actor. China is actually less capable than the Russians, but I would say almost more prolific. So what the Chinese like to do is they like to collect, 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 collect. So you see like wide scale hacks, um, like what we saw with the recent Microsoft hack. They're not as technically good or proficient as the Russians, which means that they also um, don't limit themselves in technical ways. So the big difference, for example, between the Solar Winds hack, which was kind of a Russian-led hack, versus the Chinese hack, um, was the Chinese, the Russians had, um, were a bit discriminate 
about who they collected on and how they collected, not the Chinese. So they're kind of broad strokes. Um, and then the Chinese, um, over the last few years, have also, their focus has been on economic espionage. So you get a lot of intellectual property theft. And this is somewhat condoned um, uh, by, the US, by the Chinese government. Iran and North Korea are less capable actors but they're also very busy. So the Iranians for years have been trying, they're kind of targets of opportunity against the United States. So um, trying to attack dams, trying to attack um, financial institutions, generally with limited success. So the Iranians are always trying to look for a vulnerability. They're just not as good as the Russians or the Chinese. North Koreans, on the other hand, um, are generally, if you, if you want to think about what their strategy is, it is to use cyber tactics to gain money for their regime, to keep their regime propped up. So they're they're very, very good criminal actor. Um, they've stolen millions of dollars from banks. Um, and then we have kind of the um, non-state actors. And there was a lot of focus on ISIS for a while. And, but that generally, ISIS actually is generally not that capable. In fact, a lot of the attacks that were previously attributed to ISIS ended up being Russia, pretending to be ISIS. <laughs> um, <laughs> And, and now ISIS, um, uh, they're really, they're, we're talking about information operations generally when we're talking about ISIS. Um, and I think probably the most prolific non-state actor these days are going to be cyber criminals. And those cyber criminals generally operate out of uh, Eastern Europe and Russia. Um, and increasingly, the Chinese are actually using these cyber criminal groups as proxies um, to uh, kind of obfuscate their own activities in cyberspace. OK, so a lot of bad guys out there. But the internal threat's kind of just as bad. Um, in fact, it's, it's more confusing when it comes to policy, because we have a series of overlapping laws and regulations which actually limit the way we deal with internal threats. OK, so you know, what are the, the primary internal threats? You know, in general, it's kind of a product of our own making. Um, we have a series of. Um, a burgeoning confusion about who does what when it comes to social media and narratives um, and how we deal with domestic extremism. And this is something that, that really the United States and I guess in the next cyber strategy is going to have to deal with. Um, the other kind of big consideration for the United States is the digitally enabled society that we live in. So the U.S. has doubled down on digital technology starting, you know, as soon as the digital revolution. I mean, we're kind of standing here at Stanford in the middle of this, the epicenter of the digital revolution. But it didn't, uh, it didn't invest in the cyber technologies to defend um, or protect this infrastructure. So we have a series of kind of critical infrastructures that got upgraded to digital uh, and are extremely vulnerable. And we started seeing that this summer as you know the colonial pipeline hack, um, the meat processing plants. Um, as we see ransomware proliferate, we're seeing more and more of the vulnerabilities within US critical infrastructure. And on top of that, we don't kind of know who does what in the United States to defend critical infrastructure. So whose job is it? Is it these private entities? Should they be defending their own critical infrastructure? Is it the United States federal government? If it's the United States federal government, who should be doing it? So a lot of discussions about kind of how we share information between public-private partnerships, um, whether the National Guard or the US military can get involved in critical infrastructure. Um, actually, there's a, a law that says that they and unless they're the guard, they're not supposed to. Um, so this is, you know, I think there's a lot of confusion internally about kind of who does what to defend ourselves, both from the internal threat and the external threat. OK, so those are all the problems. You know, in general, if you, if you want to sum up the cyber threat landscape for the United States, it's just a hot mess. Um, you know, in 2015, there was a lot of discussions about cyber Armageddons and cyber Pearl Harbors, and none of that stuff came true. There's no like, giant attack that took down everything. Instead, what I've just talked to you about for the last 10 minutes is a bunch of like termites almost that are, are eating at the, the kind of the foundational infrastructure of the way our digitally enabled economies work, our digitally enabled societies work, and even our digitally enabled governance. Um, so, Strategy is really important to deal with these problems.